Okay. Buckle up. I'm putting on my reading glasses. Yeah, uh oh. It's great to be in the house of God with you this morning, and it's great to know that there are people who connect with us from many different places. So, shout out to our brothers and sisters in La Crete and many other places that join us on a regular basis. Some can't because of distance, some can't because of work. Uh, but you are one with us in Jesus, and we pray the blessing and the presence of God with you today, even though you're not here with us. The Cuban Missile Crisis is an example. How many of you remember the Cuban Missile Crisis, or you know of it? It's an example of an inevitable confrontation. The world was holding its breath as Russia moved to install nuclear missiles on the back porch of the United States. They were not going to let that happen. Was this the spark that would ignite the Third World War? Sooner or later, opposing forces, powerful forces that contend for domination of any area, thing, place, business, uh, narrative, they will come into conflict and stand toe-to-toe -to -toe on the same ground, and the odds are that they will not decide to share it. And that brings us to our text in Acts chapter 4. So turn in your Bibles there with me. Where the Holy Spirit has landed Peter and John in the kitchen of the people who had Jesus crucified. Where we will see the power and the faithfulness of God to us as we walk in His will. Now this was always going to happen, what we're about to read about. And Jesus said as much in John chapter 15. He said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, everyone say, I am not of the world. But I chose you out of the world. Say, I have been chosen out of this world. Because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, said Jesus. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. There is no middle ground, folks. There is no middle ground between God's kingdom and men's kingdoms. There is no middle ground between right and wrong. There is no middle ground between righteousness and evil. We would do well to remember that. Everyone say that with me. There is no middle ground. I know which kingdom I'm from. The real superpowers aren't always obvious to the natural perspective. With worldly natural eyes, what we're about to read is a huge mismatch. But what we are about to witness reminds me of a story in 2 Kings chapter 6. You can read it on your own later, but let me paraphrase it briefly. The Arameans hate Israel and they're attacking them at every turn, though it seems like Israel is perfectly ready for whatever the Arameans are going to do. They know where they're capped, they know what their strategies are, and they just can't make any headway. And it happened over and over and over again. Well, the Aramean king is sure that there's a spy in his midst and he wants a head. But one of his servants says to him, and I quote, a servant of a, said, uh, Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. <laughs> I, I just love that. There are no secrets with God. And so the Arameans decide, well, if we're going to win the battle, we're going to have to go after Elisha. So they find out where he is, and they surround the city by night. And in the morning, the servant of Elisha gets up, and he is terrified to realize this whole city has been surrounded. And here is where we read these words. Do not fear, says Elisha, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. In the natural eyes, it was a huge mismatch. But through spiritual eyes, we understand what's really happening. Now it says that Elisha, as they came after him, Elisha prayed and smit them with blindness. He said, oh, you're in the wrong city looking for the wrong guy. Here, I'll take you. And he leads them as POWs into the capital of Damascus and presents them to the king. I love this story. And I love it for a specific reason. When you're facing fearful odds, you need to know who's on your side. And you need to know who's got your back. And in a New Testament parallel truth, John, who is about to be arrested in this passage, 
writes, You are from God, little children, have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And I wonder where he learned that. We're about to see where that lesson came from. Now, to appreciate really what's at stake, uh, we need some context for this passage. The scale of events in the temple, the things that happened around the life of the temple was enormous. Rather than thinking about church being a small gathering of people like this and small confrontations, you should think more of church like going to an Oilers game surrounded by thousands of people. That's what the temple was like. The temple was the the epicenter of all of Jewish culture. It was the center of their worship. It was the center of their culture. And so Jerusalem during the feast, and you remember we've just gone through uh, uh, Pentecost, which was the end of, of the Feast of Passover and of first fruits, and there are up from 100 to 250,000 visitors in the city of Jerusalem at that time, and they're all coming to the temple. And so this is just a few days later, and Peter and John now are baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they are intent on saving the world as Jesus had told them to go and do. And so to the temple they went, to the largest crowds that they could find, and in chapter 4 begins the confrontation that will permeate the rest of the New Testament and certainly the rest of the book of Acts. And so today we're going to invest some time in understanding the primary group of people who persecuted the early church, and we're going to learn some lessons from them. Remember last week I said religion can be useful to God. How many of you remember that? It can sometimes just draw you back those patterns. But I'd like to say that this is not one of those times. (laughs) This is not one of those examples. This is the other side of the coin. God is going to show us in this passage what he wants us to be in the example of Peter and John, and he's going to warn us not to become like those who become the adversary. So how did the keepers of God's law become God's enemy? Well, Jewish history uh, had engraved one fundamental truth into the children of Israel, and that was if they departed from their covenant with God, he would withdraw and they would be overwhelmed. They had, been, they had been trounced down by every one of the nations around them during their times of idolatry when they had not been faithful to God. And so this was now deeply ingrained with them. Seventy years of captivity in Babylon had finally cured them of their idolatries. And now they had become fierce adherents to the Mosaic law and the commandments. And it wasn't just a matter of religion. It was a matter of national survival. They had come to understand what being the covenant people of God meant. So the dynamics and the players of Acts are played out in the shadows of some specific events that have happened not that long ago. Well, long in terms of years, but not that long ago in terms of history. So around the time of 167 to 160, in that area, B.C., at that time, Alexander the Great, how many of you know who Alexander the Great was? Conquered the world, right? A great, great Greek general, um, had swept through the world, and Israel was now under the, the, uh, under the leadership, the rulership of General Ptolemy. He gave the Jews civil rights. Uh, he had allowed them to keep their culture and worship intact, but he wasn't in power long when the Seleucid Empire defeated Ptolemy, and they began to imp- Pose a very heavy Greek culture uh, and religion into the empire. Maybe you've heard the name Antiochus in the scriptures before. Uh, we'll fill you in. Antiochus was a, a leader who forcibly Hellenized, uh, that means Greekized, uh, the empire. And he wanted to remove, in all of the areas that he ruled, he wanted to remove anything that was specific or distinct about any of the original religions, and he wanted to transfer their allegiance to the Greek gods. Now, the temple for the Jewish people was the social and religious center for them. And Antiochus started by putting a gymnasium in front of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, that might not sound so bad to you and I, except Greek Uh, gymnasiums, you had to be naked. It was a celebration and an idolizing of, of male masculinity. In fact, you probably know this, that the original Olympics were started in Athens, Greece, and all the athletes competed nude, yeah, because they worshiped the form. And so when he put a, a gymnasium there, it was quite a thing. Um, 
And the, this nakedness that was a part of it uh, was something that the Jewish law strictly forbade. So you can see that he is poking the bear is what he's doing. He's making a point. He then made it going to this gymnasium mandatory. He essentially turned it into a temple, forcing people to violate their Jewish covenant law. And it was totally a power play. This was totally social engineering. And many Jews over time began to cave in and began to accept that this was just their lot. But after a token rebellion was put down, Antiochus became even more brazen. And he would begin defiling the temple itself. He vandalized it. He put an idol in the place of the altar. And he outlawed circumcision. They couldn't even practice that part of their covenant. And he set Greek idols in every town and essentially began to mandate, as you'll remember many times in history, idolatry often exacts a steep price. And in this case, it was convert to the Greek gods or face death. He even would later sacrifice a pig in the Jewish temple. And of course, we know the relationship between Jews and pigs. His persecution, though, backfired. It unified the Jews. And though many were quite Hellenized by now, Antiochus had simply taken things too far. And so when he one day sent officers to a town of, uh, uh, I can't remember how to pronounce it. It's spelled Modin, Modayin, I think. He was met by a country priest named Matthias. And when they tried to force Matthias to worship the Greek idols, he refused. And in this altercation, another Jewish man stepped forward, raised his hand against the, the Greek officer, and killed him. Matthias then tore down the idol and rallied the people, saying, Let everyone who is zealous for the law, who stands by the covenant, follow me. And so it was under Matthias, a Jewish uprising successfully began a, a rebellion against the Greeks. And they were successful in liberating Jerusalem. Not only that, they reconstituted the temple and temple worship and sacrifices. That event is still celebrated today. It's known as the Jewish holidays. Does anybody know what it is? Festival of Lights? Hanukkah. Hanukkah is the celebration of this tremendous event in Jewish history. Matthias and his sons became known as the Maccabees. And after outmaneuvering Antiochus and eventually destroying his forces, they set their sights on political independence as well. And the ultimate outcome was the formation of the Hasmo Hasmonean dynasty. And this was an autonomous Jewish state in or within, kind of under the umbrella of the Greeks. And they had rule over Palestine and freedom to once again practice their Jewish religion. And so this was really quite a coup for the Jews. So fast forward now to Acts chapter 4. The temple was now run by this Jewish aristocracy called the Sadducees. And they were the most influential descendants of the Maccabees, who had rallied around the covenant and keeping the law and being faithful to God. This made them extremely important and influential people. And it came with high prestige, with wealth, and with considerable political clout. Annas was the senior ranking high ex-priest. He had ruled as the high priest from A.D. 6 to A.D. 15. Caiaphas was his son-in-law. Now you might remember him from the trial of Jesus. He was the high priest at the trial of Jesus. Annas managed, and by the way, you have to be careful how you say his name. He managed to have five of his sons, his son-in-law, and one grandson all appointed to the successive offices of being the high priest. The high priest was essentially the president of the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was the supreme court and senate of the Jewish nation. These guys were at the top of the pile. They were the leading families of Israel. Now, the Sadducees knew that peace in the land and national survival depended on the goodwill of the Romans. At this time, now, the Romans had taken over. And so this pattern that had been established under the Greeks and now the Romans had moved in, the Jews kind of had a history of being able to keep their people in line. And so the Romans were giving them sort of favor. 
Now, because of that, the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin were sternly opposed to any kind of religious movement or nationalistic movement which might inspire a crackdown by whoever was in power over them. Now, you remember that Jesus talked a lot about his kingdom. He talked about the kingdom of God having come. And when Jesus was using kingdom language, it was quite inflammatory to these people. They weren't sure what he meant. What do you think it would have meant to them when Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a colt and being heralded as the king of the Jews? Oh, my goodness. They could see history repeating itself, and there was no way that they were going to be able to allow this to happen. But they had put an end to that whole thing with Jesus just a few months ago, or at least they believed they had until we read the events of today. They worked closely, though, with the Roman government. They collected taxes. They equipped and led the army. You could tell how much power they had. They represented the Jews domestically and internationally. This was the highest class, the ruling power of Jewish society. Not only that, they were the legal keepers of the temple according to the law because they were Levites by heritage. This was their job, the keeping of the temple, the carrying out of the sacrifices, and the care of the offerings. So, for example, the Roman coins had the image of who on them? And that violated one of the commandments, which was no graven images. And so Roman coins were not allowed in the temple on the premises. So these guys set up a, a money exchange. The money exchange exchanged Roman coins with Caesar's image on them for temple coins, which had no images on them, so that they could go in and conduct business. Now, what was the business? Well, of course, I'm sure they charged a tidy little sum for the conversion of funds. Banks have a tendency of wanting to be paid for that stuff. But they also sold sacrificial animals for those who were traveling to Jerusalem and didn't want to bring a herd with them. You could buy the lamb or the dove or whatever it was that you needed in the outer courts of the temple. Now, maybe you remember that there was this guy named Jesus who stormed in one day and kicked over the tables and took a whip and drove the animals out. And he said to them, you have turned my house from a house of prayer into a den of thieves. And he's talking about the fact that religion and Judaism and the worship of the temple had become big business. It had become big business. And these guys had become very wealthy running the empire. This was a business empire. And so they had a lot at stake. When Jesus overturned the money changers' tables, it had been a direct attack on the very people that we are talking about today. Now, the temple was divided into courts, and each one was uh, more restrictive in terms of who could access it. The huge 35-and-a-half-acre outer court was accessible to anyone. This was called the court of the Gentiles. And the door into the inner courts where only the Jewish or the, the Jew, converts to Judaism could go was a gate called Beautiful. And that was where we met the man begging alms whom Peter had raised to his feet. This man was now making a scene in the temple along with the rest of them. So we pick up the story now in Acts chapter 4, verse 1. Let's read what happens as now we have this man walking around and leaping and praising God and creating all sorts of a stir. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them and being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So just hit the pause button. Why is the temple of the guard disturbed? Two reasons. Number one, it's in the Bible. We just read it. They were teaching the people and proclaiming resurrection of the dead, the resurrection of Jesus. Those two things. That was why they clamped down. And they laid their hands on Peter and John and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. When it says the number of men, it doesn't mean that only men counted. It's just that was a way of counting. And so they said the men, not to mention the women and the children, the families that these impacted. So 5,000 believers now is probably many, many thousands more than that. 
So this, in, a sense, in essence, is the Cuban Missile Crisis in the temple. This is the confrontation between two world powers that want the same thing. This is the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of man and the kingdom of the enemy. Those who had killed Jesus and rejected the gospel would now wield their power and influence to go after John and Peter. The captain of the temple guard was the commanding officer of the temple police force. And he was outranked only by the high priest. So this was a high official that had come to arrest them. His job was to maintain order in the temple precincts. And this disturbance was definitely out of line. So here, where power and politics and religion, this was the place it was all going to collide. And now we are going to see what happens. With all the commotion of a man walking and leaping through the temple, one might see, considering the history and the story and their job, we might be able to understand why they reacted rather abruptly to all that was going on. Their job was to prove to the Romans that they could keep their own people in line. The temple guard, though, was probably too late. Their arrest came after the fact. The public opinion had already spoken. All of the people were praising God for the great miracle that had already happened. The power of the Holy Spirit was on full display, and another 2,000 men have been added to the 3,000 from the day of Pentecost. This is, a, this is revival, and there's great joy <clears throat> to the Sanhedrin. This is definitely getting out of hand. And so it was too late in the day for the trial to be completed before sundown according to their laws, so it would have to wait until morning. So they were incarcerated and kept overnight. Now, pick up verse 5. It says, On the next day their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and Annas the high priest was there, and Caiaphas, you remember these two guys, and John and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. This is interesting because it's not just office, it's descent. These are the family lines. So all of who's who was there. And when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? That's their first question, probably asked by Caiaphas. Now, it's amazing what a heart preoccupied with self-interest can miss. Huh? Huh? It's amazing that they could miss this. They completely ignore the miracle and zoom right into what is actually most important to them. Not how did this happen, not tell us what has happened, but who do you think you are teaching in our temple? Who gave you the right? Who do you think you are? This was supposed to be the home field court for the Sadducees. But it turns out that Peter and John have no respect for being the visiting team. They are walking right in, and they are going to do what God has called them to do. But God is restaking his claim to his people. He is restaking his claim, his kingdom. And it doesn't matter, and it doesn't include an alliance with the government of Rome or a religious system of traditions that are enforced by men. Remember in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, An hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Are you one of those worshipers this morning? You know, we come into church and we can be any number of people this morning. We can be those like the lame man who came looking for help. We can be those like Peter and John coming to do the work of ministry. We can be those like those who heard the message and gave their hearts to Christ and started a new life. And we can be the religious who put a wet blanket on everything. <laughs> Because that's not the way we do it, and that's not the songs we used to sing, and that's not the way we, and it's not this, and it's not that, and it's not what we like. And who does this next generation think they are changing the, you know, have we all heard it? Have we all heard the complaints? Who's ever felt them? Aha, different question, right? Who's ever felt them? 
I liked it the old way. I liked the way we used to do it. It's okay. We've all been on all sides of these equations. So the question, I think, is how in the world did the, did the Sanhedrin, how did the Sadducees so completely miss it, considering the Maccabees, considering the revolt, considering their zeal for the covenant with God? How did they wind up on the wrong side of the equation? Well, the Sadducees were descendants of the Maccabees who looked back to Matthias and to Judas and Jonathan and Simon as having inaugurated the Messianic age. You see, they had a different view of what the prophetic scriptures taught. And they saw themselves as the descendants of those men as perpetuating what their fathers had started 160 years ago. It had been and fallen to them to keep that movement, that act of God, that process of God moving forward. As priests of the tribe of Levi, they rightly claimed to represent ancient orthodoxy as passed on to Israel by Moses after God had delivered Israel from Egyptian slavery. And so they felt that they were on the right side of the equation in every way. But they were not interested in innovation. They were not interested in any kind of corruption of the centuries-old worship traditions that God himself had instituted. They opposed any developments in biblical law. They opposed any speculations about angels and demons. And they most certainly rejected the theology of resurrection. We recall that post-crucifixion, the Sanhedrin sought Pilate's permission to secure the tomb of Jesus. Why? Because they were so dead set against anybody stealing the body and perpetrating a ruse that, that actual resurrections could happen by hiding the stealing the body of Jesus that they went and put guards there to make sure that nobody pulled a fast one. That's how deeply they were committed to enforcing their beliefs. Beyond this, they believed that God had already instituted his salvation through their fathers, through the Maccabean heroes. They didn't believe in, 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 in the Messiah as a person. They believed in it as, a, as a, an ideal. And they didn't believe that there would be a cataclysmic, uh, datable event like the resurrection of Jesus any more than they believed that there was a person. They believed that this would be a divine process by which God would work out and move them back into a place of earthly dominance as the people of God. So you can tell that they had completely divorced themselves from an individual Messiah. And you know, when we begin to start changing our theology, when we begin to start adjusting it, it can make us blind to the things that God is actually saying. Have you ever read the scripture over and over again believing it meant one thing and then sat down and the Spirit of God opened your mind to it and suddenly you went, I have, n I have read the Bible my whole life and I've never seen that before. Is it possible for you and I to become blinded by what we think we know? Absolutely. And so let's take a lesson today. They instead stressed maintaining a practical peace with the Roman government that didn't interfere with the religious heart of the nation. All of this makes the arrest, trial, and agreement between Pilate and the Sanhedrin concerning Jesus much more clear. Do you remember when the Sanhedrin was debating what to do about Jesus and they decided that they must kill him, that it was Caiaphas who said, isn't it better that one man suffers, then we provoke the Romans to come down and wipe out the whole nation? We don't want to go back to the times of Antiochus. We don't want to go back to the Seleucid Empire. We remember those days. That wasn't that many years ago. And so we can understand. Now, Luke has recorded Jesus' prophetic promise in, in the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 21. Remember that Luke and Acts were probably all written as one large volume. But if we go back to the Gospel of Luke 21, Jesus prophesied exactly what Peter and John were about to face and were facing. He said, They will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons. 
bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. Isn't that powerful? What a powerful and accurate prophetic word from Jesus. By the way, it's another great reason to pursue and seek the baptism and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. When we're called to give an account, the Holy Spirit will give us words to say. And so as promised, Peter and John become the conduit of the person and the ministry now of the Holy Spirit. Everyone repeat after me. I too am a conduit for the power of and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. What, what Peter is about to do and say is absolutely supernatural. It is the Holy Spirit helping him know what to say. So we pick it up in verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all of the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands before you in good health. I think Caiaphas should have been more careful how he asked the question because he got an earful. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. <laughs> now, Peter calls the healing an act of profound kindness by God. And you don't want to hear it, he says, but it's in the name of Jesus that this has happened. You already tried to eliminate Jesus, but you failed. God overruled you by raising him from the dead. Now, keep in mind who he's talking to. Who's he talking to? The Sadducees. And what do the Sadducees hate? Changes to their tradition, angels and demons, and talk about the resurrection. <laughs> and so here's Peter pounding away at the high priest and the elite of his nation, the ones who control the temple and all of the worship, and he's telling him the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, who is risen from the dead. It's too bad he's so shy, <laughs> isn't it? You know what? One of the striking things about this passage for me is the courage and the, the forthrightness of Peter who was the guy who denied Jesus at his trial. He is pounding away at the, the Sanhedrin, at the high court, at the supreme court of the land. I, lo I love it. I, I kind of wonder, like, do you realize what you're doing? Do you realize who you're talking to? But remember now, this isn't just a little courtroom. This is like this is like happening on the, at center ice of, of Roger's place. There's thousands of people. This is a public trial. This is the Supreme Court, and it's being done all in, out in the open. It's really quite amazing. In verse 11, he would go on to quote Psalm 118 when he talks about the stone the builders rejected and the chief cornerstone. There's a couple of really powerful things about some of these things that Peter slips in. And it would not be lost on all of these highly trained, rabbinical trained people. This, the, the, there is a word play between the words stone and son. Jesus often called himself the son of man. But the word stone is E-B-E-N, and the word son is spelled B-E-N. And they're quite similar. And so this was a common, th this passage out of Psalm 118 was a, a one of the early known messianic uh, verses. And all of them would agree that this was a messianic verse. And so now here is Peter the fisherman digging into theological depths of things that they're only supposed to know. And he's reminding them that this stone is actually the son of God. That play on words. Peter is using it. 
The Jewish material from this time also includes a book called The Testament of Solomon, which unambiguously refers to a final capstone placed on the summit of the Jerusalem temple to complete the whole structure of the temple. That stone was called the capstone. And Peter is striking at the very heart of this religious system and staking Jesus' claim to be the very completion of it. The stone which the you, the builders, rejected has become the capstone. It is, he's essentially saying Jesus is the finishing of everything that this temple stands for. It was Jesus who completed all of the revelation of God. And it is Jesus that this all points towards. And believe me, the point was not lost on the people of the Supreme Court that day. Isaiah also warned and used that term of the stone. He said of Jesus of the Messiah that he would be the cornerstone. But for many, he would also be a stumbling stone. And you see, he's making this reference as well. And so here is Peter. Peter uses the word in verse 12, salvation. And he chooses a word that means both salvation in terms of the restoration of health, but also a word that means preservation uh, for eternal life. That it means the freedom of de from death, which is about resurrection, by the way, which is, again, just driving these guys crazy. So Jesus is the healer of bodies, and he's the giver of eternal life. He is the risen Lord. Look at the evidence standing right here beside me the man who has been lame for 40 years. And this salvation, he says, is found in no other name, in no other tradition, in no other religious system, in none of the laws, not in your heroes Abraham or Moses or David or Matthias, not in the temple and not in its sacrifices. It is only in the name of Jesus that you can be saved. And then the defense rests. I love that Peter gives it to him both barrels. There's nothing watered down about his statements. How many of you believe that facing that group of people, this was definitely a supernatural courage? Keep in mind, these are the men who had Jesus killed. These were powerful, powerful people. They could disappear you. And nobody knows what happened. There's just a fresh bump under the sands of the desert. What Peter just did was a surgical dismantling of everything the Sadducees teach and believe. What was supposed to be his defense has turned into a dramatic offense. And he is preaching now to those of the highest ranks, just as Jesus told him he would. Peter is now on the attack. And he's not only on the offense for their souls, but he is offensive beyond belief to the Sadducees. And they are shocked. <laughs> their response is recorded in verse 13. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated, untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize. Everyone say began. Do this. Where have we seen this before? And what did they recognize? These guys have been with Jesus. And now it, what just happened? They're saying, what just happened here? The Sanhedrin is so taken aback by the words and the delicate legal and theological arguments, the sustained reasoning, using fundamental truths from the Scriptures, from the Old Testament. And these were who? Uneducated, untrained men. They're not even supposed to know this stuff. They were caught so off guard, they just removed them because they didn't know what to say. And here is this healed man standing as exhibit A for the defense. And you can't argue with that either. And everyone in the courts knows what's happened. The mob that helped them crucify Jesus this time was on Peter's side. And there was nothing they could do about it. 
And then they're remembering. This is exactly what happened. You ever had nightmare flashbacks? This is exactly what happened every time we tried to corner Jesus with one of those tricky questions about divorce or paying taxes or seven husbands of one wife. All of that sneaky stuff they were trying to do to trip him up. They remembered how Jesus would absolutely bury them in front of all the people to where they were again silent. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. What's the motto of our church? Be with him, be like him, baby. Oh, yeah, that's this. That's this. That's what's happening right here. That's what happens when we have a relationship with Jesus. We pick it up in verse 15. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, what shall we do with these guys? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle had taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem. Everybody knows, and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let's warn them to no longer speak uh, in his name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Now, a little thing about the fact, remember, this is the Supreme Court. So Jewish law held that a person must be aware of the consequences of his crime before his crime, before he could be punished in that way for it. So in non-capital cases, the common people, as distinguished from those with rabbinic teaching who sh presumably knew, knew better, had been given legal admonition before witnesses and could only be punished for an offense when they relapsed after a due warning. So in other words, if I didn't tell you what the consequences were, I can't meet them out on you. But now they're saying, next time you're really going to get her. And we've been very clear with you. The Sanhedrin's assessment of Peter and John is clear that they are uneducated, untrained men. And therefore, due legal process demanded that they receive a fair warning before they should be punished in any way. And so they're given clear instructions as per verse 18. They summoned them and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. By the way, if you've got this recorded on PVR, just put your fingers in your ears. So spoiler alert, okay? They're not going to listen. Peter and John aren't going to listen. <laughs> They're not going to heed the warning. And, uh, and so and immediately here in, in chapter 5, we're going to read about how they're right back at it in no time at all. But this time, there won't be a simple verbal warning. It will be followed by an uh, incentive to not do that again. And they were going to be held accountable. And so in Acts 5.40, we read, after calling the disciples in, they flogged them this time. Because they now had been given fair legal warning and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they released them again. But Peter and John hadn't actually broken any laws. However, this disturbance was not going to be tolerated. It is noteworthy in this passage to note that the response of the Supreme Court of the temple, the Sanhedrin, they never disputed any of the facts of Peter's testimony. They never argued any of his theology. In spite of their theology and their considerable power, they could not produce the body of Jesus or any other evidence to refute what Peter had claimed. The resurrection Peter and John were teaching was supported by the power that had been demonstrated in the man's life before them. And the court had no rebuttal and had no recourse. So this is the Supreme Court, a public trial. It all has to be done legally. The crowds are celebrating an undeniable miracle. They cannot shortcut this in any way. And so they make very clear what will happen next time. And their ignorance will be no shield for them. And to remove any illusions from the Sanhedrin, Peter and John answered in chapter 4, verse 19, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And when they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. 
the most powerful revelation of this text for me is the absolute uncompromising preaching of the gospel. Peter is without fear. Paul would later write in his letter to the Romans, I am under obligation both to Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Can you say that this morning? I am not ashamed of this gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. If we're going to accomplish the mandate that Jesus has given us, we need to learn to communicate the gospel in an absolutely clear and concise way the way Peter did this day in the face of even tremendous intimidation. How many of you admit that sharing the gospel is a little intimidating for you at your job, with your neighbors, maybe with some of your family? How many of you would say that? Yeah, it's, you know, we had a great group of people that went through an evangelism class, and, and we talked about this, and John did a great job with that class. And uh, we talked about that intimidation factor. And this is why we need the Holy Spirit. We need a spiritual courage to be able to go to the places and do the things that our natural man is afraid of. Remember, looking through natural eyes, this was a huge mismatch between a couple of nobodies named Peter and John and the aristocracy and political control and the Supreme Court of Israel. And yet, it was a blowout. It was a blowout for the Holy Spirit. And that's what God can do when we are surrendered to and filled with the courage and the wisdom of the Spirit of God. I'm not sure who you identify with in this passage today. Are you the healed man? Are you the Spirit-filled disciple, servant of Christ? Maybe you're the new convert who heard the gospel and is, is excited to respond and start that new life with Jesus? Or is there a chance that maybe we're the religious? I don't know who you identify with this morning, but I ask you to put yourself in this story somewhere. I think all of us fit in this story somewhere, or we should. If you're the healed and the saved, let it ring from the rooftops. Don't be afraid to tell people of the Jesus you love, of the one who has saved you, the one who gives your life meaning and purpose, the one who you believe will save them, who loves them, who wants to work in their family, who wants to work in their marriage, who wants to work in their body. Offer to pray with the faith you have in the Jesus you know so that they can come to know the Jesus you know. But make it clear. Jesus saves and Jesus heals. If you're the kingdom servant, then let the message of your lips and life be clear as a bell. Don't pull punches. Don't talk in vagaries or generalities. Say it. It's Jesus you need. It's Jesus who saves. It's repentance from sin. That's what, that's what it brings us into the kingdom of God. There is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. It is the name of Jesus. And if you haven't dealt with Jesus, you haven't got it sorted out yet. But I'll walk with you. I'll pray for you. I'll help you find answers to your questions. Be a faithful communicator of the gospel. If you are a religious person, but maybe you don't know Jesus yet, Peter's message is one more opportunity for the religious to repent and be saved. Peter is telling them, any place you lead people other than Jesus will be the ruin not only of yourselves, but of this nation. There is no other name except Jesus. And so, if that's you, then come to Jesus. If you're religious, if you're a church-going person or you've, you've had an affiliation, you know, many people lay claim to being Catholic or Protestant or Pentecostal or whatever they are, but it's just in name. It's the, it's the traditions of their family. It's the church they go to. But they've never met Jesus. Don't be a religious person without the true meaning 
which is the connection to Jesus himself. And if that's you, then repent of self-righteousness. Repent of trying to earn God's approval. Meet Jesus at the cross. Step up to the empty tomb and become a recipient of eternal life. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? Holy Spirit, would you please put each one of us into this story exactly where you know we belong? Would you give us each a conviction of how you are coming to us this morning, of how you see us this morning? Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for what you unleashed in Acts 4 through Peter, an absolute clear call to be the people of God, the servants of Christ, to be loyal and courageous witnesses. Lord, their lives became a powerful witness for you in the halls of power, in the halls of politics. Lord Jesus, we want our voices to be heard in the schools, in the businesses, in our community. We want to be known for the being the people who bring the hope and life of Jesus. And so this morning, Lord, if you are here this morning and in this story, you see yourself as the man who sat by the gate who needs the healing, then this morning I want you to begin to pray right now. Just raise your hands to the Lord, even just where you sit. Just open your hands and raise them and just begin to pray to receive the healing of Jesus in your body. We already started this earlier. But just be the recipient. By faith, claim the healing power of God in your life. If you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus, you've already made a commitment to him, and you want your life to be that faithful witness that brings others to Christ, then I want you to begin to pray for a fresh infilling of the Spirit of God. Would you just put your hands up as well? Just put your hands out and just begin to pray. Just you and God. This is your own altar call. You are doing business with the Holy Spirit this morning. Think of the people in your life that you want the courage to tell about Jesus that you want to be able to tell it without any equivocation or hesitancy. You want to be able to just speak about Jesus. If you are here this morning and you are religious, you have forms, you come to church, but there's no vibrancy in your life. It's all tradition. And you want to meet Jesus. Then I want you to raise your hands and Right now, invite the revelation of Jesus, the person of Jesus, to penetrate through all of your religious thinking, through all of what you think you know, and have him reveal himself. Ask him, Lord Jesus, reveal yourself to me. I choose to learn and come into relationship with the risen Lord Jesus. And if you are here this morning and you've never made a personal commitment, you've never repented of your sin and invited Jesus to be the Lord of your life and you determined that you would walk with him in the ways that honor him, in ways that demonstrate your love for him all of your days, then I want to give you that opportunity this morning. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let's do that important piece of business right now. If that's you this morning and you are ready to commit to Jesus for the rest of your life, I'm not talking to you if you've made this decision. I'm talking to you if you haven't. But you're ready this morning. Would you just open your eyes and wave at me, make eye contact with me this morning. I, I just want you to be able to know that I saw you and you saw me and we are just going to agree together. Is there anyone here this morning? In the balcony? God bless you. Is there anyone else? God sees your heart. He knows your heart. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to name the name of Jesus. Do not be afraid to come to him. He will save you to the uttermost. 
Now, somebody has raised their hand this morning, so I'm going to ask you and invite you all to pray. If you're at home, you pray this prayer with me. Pray, Lord Jesus, I want to thank you this morning that even though the world didn't recognize you, that today I know who you are. (laughs) You are the Son of God who came to take away the sin of the world, who died on the cross for my sin. And so in the name of Jesus this morning, I repent from my sin. And I choose you to be the Lord of my life. From this day on, I will walk with you, Jesus. I ask you to make me a new creation, to teach me what it means to live as a child of God. And Lord, I'm going to need your help. So I ask you even right now, fill me with your spirit who will teach me how to walk this life. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Thank you for giving me the gift of eternal life. Thank you that I am new as of this moment. In Jesus' name, amen.